Hi, it's Amy from Amy Rooney Designs, and today I'm here to walk you through the steps to make my new pattern, Be Merry. It's a mini quilt wall hanging pattern or a festive table topper. Both settings are super fun. They use raw edge applique as well as patchwork to create a fun and festive addition to your holiday decor. Before we get started on the sewing steps, I wanted to talk just briefly about fabric selection for this pattern. There's a couple of things that you wanna think about when selecting fabric for your raw edge applique. The first is that you'll notice that, especially on the letters, the applique pieces are very narrow. So you'll wanna make sure that you're choosing something that you're not gonna lose a portion of your letter because of the print of fabric that you're choosing. Using a tone on tone or even a solid fabric is a great way to make sure that you don't lose any of your letter shape and makes it very legible if you're doing something that is a more saturated print. The second thing that you'll wanna think about is making sure that there's plenty of contrast between your letters or even your holly and the background fabric that you're choosing. So in this um, center block here, you can see that I've chosen this star print but because my holly leaves are a little bit larger and they have a little bit more um, weight to them, that you don't really lose a lot of that applique in uh, with this print. But I chose not to use that same print as the background for the letters because I knew that my letters were so skinny that if some of these larger stars landed behind some of these letters, it might make the letters a little bit more difficult to read. So make sure that if you're choosing something that does have a print, which I love because of the texture and the fun that it adds, that you make sure that you're choosing something that isn't going to interfere with the readability of your, um, of your applique. So I have one more sample to show you. This is the one we'll be making in this video or one of them that we'll be making in this video. And that is the solids version. You can see that solids work beautifully for this project and makes it really easy to read as long as you're choosing colors that have a lot of contrast. So those are some tips on fabric selection. And now let's get started with our project. To begin to create our holly wreath applique, we are going to take our background square and we are going to first fold it into half. So we're going to just fold it in half in one direction and then use your fingers to just create a two to three inch long crease in the center of the folded side. Then you're going to open that up and then fold it the other way. Let's see if I can show you those lined up. And then again, you're going to just create a two to three inch crease on the other fold. We're gonna open this up and now we have a little folded plus sign there in the center of our background fabric. The next thing we're gonna do is take our pattern template that is in the pattern, and you're going to take a marking pen. You could use a mechanical pencil, but if you have, like, this is a friction pen, which is heat, um, it disappears with heat, or a water-soluble, some kind of disappearing marking pen, um, it's going to be better that way if, um, depending on where you place your holly leaves, if a little bit of your marking is showing, you have a way to uh, get rid of it down the road. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to line up this square corner of my quarter circle template in one of the quadrants of my pressed plus in the center of my, um, in the center of my background fabric. Then I'm going to take my marking pencil and I'm not gonna do a solid line. Again, we're going to be putting our holly leaves there and we want to give ourselves as much play as possible with where we position things. So I'm just going to create a few dashes along this curved edge and it's just to kind of give me a guide to place my wreath on there. And then I am going to kind of mark at the corner so that I have a good place to line up the next quarter circle. So you can kind of see my little markings here and then I'm going to take my template and I'm going to move over to the next quadrant and then I'm just going to repeat that until I have all a full circle marked.
Now that I have my whole circle traced, I'm going to start to place my holly leaves. Now, if you want to do just a simple wreath, you will just trace the larger leaf shapes. If you are doing a fuller wreath, you will trace both the large and the small wreath shapes. And then there's just a subtle difference in placing it. Now, if you're doing just the simple wreath, you're just going to line up your holly leaves tip to tip. And you'll see on your leaves, and it's kind of a subtle difference and it's not exact, but typically there's one side that has kind of a sharper point than the other side. And what I like to do is put two of those sharper points together because it gives me a little bit more of an open space where then I can put my holly berries. So what I tend to do is I will kind of set them in pairs with that um, pointier end kind of facing together. And then I'll kind of line up the other end so that it um, is there again, both kind of crossing that um, marked circle there to just give it the best shape. Now I'm doing this um, not on a pressing surface, but you are going to want to take your um, take your background fabric and your holly leaves to your pressing surface. You will kind of arrange them how you like. Now my ironing board, my pressing surface is only big enough to work about half at a time. And so I will place the top half and then I will place the bottom half. So when you go to do that, you will remove the paper backing from your holly leaf and then again, you're just going to line it up where you want it. And then you will follow the manufacturer's instructions for whatever fusible adhesive you're using. And you will press all of those into place. And then once you have all of your leaves in place, fused where you want them, then you can go back and add your holly berries. In this case, I've decided to use two different colors of berries. Um... You can do them in groups of two or three. You can just do little groups of two. There are lots of extra berries in your um, in the pattern so that you can play with them a little bit and decide where you want them. When I'm doing this simple wreath, typically I will do groups of two or three berries at each of the pairs, again, where kind of the pointy ends come together. But you can also just kind of scatter your berries in and around um, the wreath however you like it. So you will position them how you like and press and fuse them into place. Then you have a choice here and that is if you want to sew your applique before you put your applique piece into your project or if you want to wait and do it at the quilting step. The only difference is it might be a little bit easier to manipulate your fabric, especially, you know, if you want to do a little bit of free motion applique or that kind of thing. I do have the background pieces sized a little bit generously so that if there's any shrinkage, which is minimal, but it's just enough to throw off the squareness of your background piece. So you'll want to make sure after you fuse, and if you're going to sew before you put it together, after you sew, that then you go and square up your piece to the size indicated in the pattern. So it's easier to manipulate it if you're sewing around it before you piece it all together. If you wait and sew it after it's all pieced together and you're at the quilting stage, it gives just a little bit more puffiness to your applique pieces. It also gives it a little bit more stability because the stitches are going through not just your applique piece and your background fabric, but your applique piece, your background fabric, your batting, and your backing fabric. So. It's just going to hold that into place. So if you're turning yours into like a pillow or something, it may be something that you want to do is wait until the quilting step just to add that extra layer of stability, but it should be fine either way. It's just really a matter of preference at which stage you like to do it. I like to do free motion quilting with mine and I just find it's easier to do that when it's all together because there's a little bit more stability with the batting and the backing fabric there. But again, it's totally preference however you want to do your project. But I wanted to show you the difference between what the simple wreath looks like and what the fuller wreath looks like. So this one is the simple, and again, it's just one row of um, holly leaves. And the other version is the fuller wreath. Now again, I'm putting these into pairs of two. You can kind of see where I have all of the tips touching. 
And that's again so that I have kind of a place to put the berries and have it um, kind of make sense to me. And that's just how I like to do it. But you can scatter your leaves all the way around so that they're kind of all overlapping each other. Um, you can put them together however you want. I will say when you're doing um, this fuller wreath, because you're kind of angling the leaves a little bit, I have some of them where the darker is underneath, some where it's over the top. You'll wanna make sure that you're keeping your wreath shape round. And also as you angle, especially on these um, outer edges, you wanna make sure that again, you're accounting for both seam allowances and room for trimming. So make sure that you're not angling them too far that you're going to lose part of your wreath there. Um, but it's pretty similar. You're just, again, following the markings on your circle to kind of keep it in a nice round shape. And then you can lay them out and overlap them as you desire. And then again, you can do the groups of berries or you could just kind of scatter berries throughout the whole thing, especially if you're not putting them deliberately into groups. Um, you can just scatter the berries all the way around and it can be just a nice full textured kind of layered wreath. Once you have your wreath all in positioned and fused, and we're going to pretend that I've done that here, it's going to, um, the next step will be dependent on which project you're doing. If you're doing the mini quilt, you are going to position your words into the center of your wreath here. If you are doing the table topper, then your wreath will be one unit and then you will have a separate background piece for your words. In the pattern, I have um, kind of positioning instructions, but I wanted to show you what that looks like here on this, um, if you do them in the center here. So I like to start with the letters B and E. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this crease line, which I know is in the center, and this crease line, again, centered, to center my letters around. Now, the top letters are going to be um, about three quarters of an inch above that centered line. Because the second word in the phrase is Mary, it's bigger and just carries a little bit more visual weight. So I am kind of fudging my phrase just a little bit above center here, just so that visually it looks a little more centered. So I'm going to take my letter B and my letter E, and I'm going to line them up um, at that three quarter of an inch mark. Now, I like to have my letters spaced about a quarter of an inch apart. Um, you can make them closer or a little bit further spaced out if you would like. So you'll peel off the backing and fuse those into place and then I will come back and I'm going to again use my folds here and I'm going to use my ruler, my acrylic ruler here as a guide to help me kind of line it up. And I'm going to measure about a half an inch underneath these um, fused letters and then I'm going to place my other letters. And typically I will just kind of eyeball it until they look balanced to me. Um, but what I will do is mark up, you know, line up my uh, marking here with that center fold. And then I'm going to kind of measure out. And in this case, I want to, it's about four and a quarter inches that kind of has them evenly spaced the outside edges of my letters for this word here and then I'm just going to kind of move the letters around to make sure that that looks even and um and that kind of thing so actually I'm going to go about four and a half one two three four and a half that way and one two three four and a half this way and then again I'm going to be about a scant quarter of an inch apart. Now, again, it's not gonna be exact because some letters like this E and the M are wide and big and carry a lot more visual weight than the two R's. And so you're going to, um, you know, space them a little bit differently and your eye will kind of tell you. But again, I'm just kind of pushing them up against the edge of that ruler to make sure that the tops of them are all lined up the letters should all be the same height from the pattern, so you don't have to worry about the bottoms lining up if the tops are. So I'm just going to kind of 
eyeball them, make sure that they're how I want. And in when you're at your ironing surface, it's easier to kind of get these to lay flatter if you've already peeled off the backing. So I will peel off the backing, get them all into place. Again, follow the manufacturer's instructions and then fuse them really well into place. So if you're doing the mini quilt wall hanging version, this is how it's going to get lined up. You're gonna follow kind of a sim similar method if you are doing the version for the table topper. The only difference is going to be that you are working on a smaller piece of fabric. The measurements are a little bit different. And in this case, what I'll do is begin with the Y and the B and I will position them in, and I wanna say in the pattern it says, it's about a one and three quarters inch inside from the sides, about three quarters of an inch from the top and the bottom. And again, on this piece, we are going to, um, once it's fused and if you're sewing it ahead of time sewn, then we're gonna trim these up. So you wanna make sure that you're accounting for seam allowances and room to trim. Um, and then when you do trim, make sure on both of the pieces that you're centering your applique so that you don't cut all of the excess just off of one side, that you're kind of trying to evenly make sure that it looks right on all four sides. So again, I will start with my Y and my B, and then I kind of just space the letters about a quarter of an inch. And again, I'm gonna use my ruler to make sure that the bottoms are all evenly lined up or the tops, whichever side you're lining them up from. And then you will just naturally have this gap left into place. Now, if you don't like this gap, if it's too big, too small, whatever, again, you can crunch your letters closer together. You can shift them if you want. Just again, be mindful of seam allowances for trimming and things like that. And then make sure it looks even and balanced to your eye. So once we have those appliques done, then we are ready to start building our um, our to prepare quilt. the borders, we are going to first start by taking our strips that we've cut and we're going to sew them into pairs. Now, I like to do it this way so that I don't have to cut out 64 little blocks. I can just cut out 32 bigger rectangles. It's a little less cutting, a little less sewing. Um, and you can still get a really nice scrappy look with it. If you feel more comfortable cutting out squares, you can go ahead and do that. But I just like this method. I feel like it makes it a little bit more efficient. So you're gonna take your two strips and sew them together along one long edge. Again, we're always using a quarter inch seam allowance. Once you have them sewn together, we're gonna take it and press it open. And I like to press the seam allowances open so that we can mix and match all of our blocks. And it doesn't matter which one is next to the other one because all of the seam allowances are pressed the same. Then we are going to take our rotary cutter and our ruler and we are going to cut these in half. And then we will have two two patch blocks for each strip set that we sew. Once we have all of our two patches cut, we are going to take them and sort them into groups. Now this is where um, it's going to separate a little bit. If you are making the wall hanging version, you are going to separate them into four groups of eight. If you are making the table topper version, you are going to separate them into eight groups of four. Um, what I like to do is I will just start kind of laying out the rows. So for my um, wall hanging version, I'm just going to start making my four, you know, piles for my four rows. And then I'm just going to kind of keep adding to them and rearranging them until I get a nice distribution of color and scale, darks and lights. Um, in this case, I'm working with reds and greens, so I kind of want to make sure I have reds and greens kind of spread out. And in the wall hanging version, they are going to be um, stacked up into a row of eight across, two high. Um, so your two patches will be on the tall version and going across. Now, when you go to do the table topper version, instead of lining them up along the sewn seam, you are going to line them up end to end, just like this to create the eight rows. So again, I will just kind of create piles and I, you know, these are scrappy and they're meant to kind of come together. So usually I just kind of start and then I will go back and I will kind of rearrange and be like, okay, I think I'm going to flip this one just so that it's 
red and green. These two are too close to the same, so I'm gonna swap that out for another one. And then I'm just gonna keep rearranging them until I have them sorted out how I like them. Then, depending on which version you're making, if you are doing the rows for the table topper version, you will take them and sew them along the short side. If you are making the um, wall hanging version, you are going to take them and place them along the long side and sew them together. And when you are sewing this version together, you want to make sure that you are taking the time to make sure that your seam allowances are um, lined up really well. So where those two different pieces come together, if you um, need to pin it um, to keep them together and accurate, you'll want to do that. And that's what's gonna give you really nice crisp grid lines on your patchwork border. So once you have them all sewn together, your um, border for your wall hanging is going to look just like this. And if you are um, doing your table topper, I will come back and show you once we start to build that border what that's gonna look like. To make the heart blocks that will become the cornerstones of our patchwork border, um, we're going to start by cutting eight sets of two different pieces. Now, the reason we're constructing this heart block in this manner is I wanted to continue the look of the patchwork. And so I wanted each quadrant of the heart to fit inside one of the squares from the patchwork border. So we're gonna be working with some small pieces here and I have a few tips that will help you get more success with this. And this is a great way to kind of work on your accuracy and matching up points and things like that. And the first tip I'm gonna give you is before you cut out your pieces for this, um, start your fabric first. It really helps these little pieces, especially you've got little one inch squares up here to keep their shape and kind of the creases that you press will be much sharper. It'll help the angles not stretch quite so much. So start your fabric and then cut out your pieces. Now, if you are really um, aware, <laughs> I should say, of how your corners come together, you may want to sew your four patchwork borders first and then figure out what fabrics you need for each of the four corners of your hearts. Um, so that you're not repeating fabrics or anything like that. I tend to kind of wing it a little bit more than that and I just sort of sew the borders together, sew the hearts together and then put them where they go. But if you, if that's something that might bother you if you end up with, you know, two reds next to each other or whatever, you may want to kind of map out which quadrant each heart goes in. Also, once you've kind of decided which order your heart is going to be and which order the colors need to be, it's helpful to take pictures of each of your different heart blocks. You are only making four of them, so it's not super overwhelming, but it's helpful to take pictures so that you know when you go to put it together, which color is on which side and that kind of thing. It'll help with getting the angles and everything just right. Once you have all of your pieces cut, now we're going to start marking some things. Um, you're going to mark two squares for the bottom half of each. And I went ahead and just marked it on my white fabric, um, but you can mark it on the colored for all of these if that's easier for you. It just really depends on the colors that you're doing. So you need to mark diagonal lines on two of your white squares um, for the bottom of your heart. And then your two one inch heart or squares for each of the top sections of your heart, you need a diagonal line. Now, when you come to a fabric like this, that's really dark, um, that gets a little bit tricky. A couple of tips for that is you can either use, say, a white marking pen or something. You could mark a crease in your dark color and use that as your guide. Or you can go ahead and put marks onto your sewing machine itself that will line up straight with your needle. And then if you just line up the two corners of this with your marked line on your sewing machine, you'll get a straight line. Some machines come with lasers. Um, there's tape that you can buy that has your quarter inch seam marked out that also has a straight line. I typically just use a post-it note. I use my ruler to help me keep it straight and then I just stick a post-it note on the front of my machine and that's what I use to line up all of my pieces so that I get my angles. Once you have all of your marking done, then it's gonna be time to take them to your machine. So what I typically will do is I will leave my little one inch wide strips 
kind of on my cutting surface in the order that they're gonna go. And then I will take my two squares for the bottom half of my heart and my two little one inch squares for the top of my heart. I will take those to my machine and then I'm gonna sew all of those angles. So the first angle that I'm gonna sew is on my top of my heart. I'm going to take my little one inch square and I'm going to line it up with the top corner of this. Um, and I want my diagonal lines to go towards the middle of the two long sides. I'm gonna sew along that line and then I'm going to place my second one Again, the angles of my diagonal line here need to go towards the middle, and then I'm gonna sew right on that line. I'm gonna repeat that for the second top heart block. And then for my bottom heart block, I'm going to place the two squares together, one white, one colored, and then I'm going to sew again right on that diagonal line for both parts of the bottom of my heart. And then once that's sewn, you're going to have pieces that look like this. So here are my two top of my heart, and here are the two bottom of my heart. Now, again, if you're using directional fabric or something, um, you're gonna wanna pay attention to the angles and how you're placing fabrics here. So I really recommend using non-directional <laughs> fabric so that you don't have to worry so much about it. Um, otherwise, it can get a little finicky there. Um, so, once you have that done, then you are going to cut a quarter of an inch away from your sewn line on each of these places that you've sewn. And then you will open this up and press that seam allowance open. So you can see on the back side of this bottom one that I have my seam allowance pressed open. And then you're going to take the shorter of your one inch strips and you're gonna sew it to the tops and the bottoms of your squares that make up your heart. Now, again, you need to pay attention to which part of the heart is which so that you sew them on so that your angles, you need to have an angle heading to the right and an angle heading to the left. And so you wanna make sure that, especially on this bottom part, when you're sewing this first one on that you're paying attention. Then once that's done, and I usually just press the seam allowance towards that um, small one inch strip on all four of those sections, then you're going to take your longer one inch strip and you're going to place it on top on each side and again, sew along that line. So again, once if you have these separate from each other, you can't tell which one's right and which one's left. So you wanna make sure that you're paying attention so that you sew it onto the right side of one and the left side of the other so that when you go to put them together, you have both sides of a heart instead of two of the same side, Does that, if that makes sense. So once you have all four of those sewn on, then you'll sew the two top pieces together and the two bottom pieces together. And then you'll sew both rows together and then you will get your heart block. So it's just a fun way to kind of continue that patchwork border, helps give it just a little bit of interest and um, it's just kind of a fun little accent. Then you're going to take your heart blocks, you will make four of these, like I said, and you're gonna sew two on either side of one of your patchwork panels. So I will just take my panel and then I'm going to line it up. And again, I'm going to keep that center seam lined up and sew it on, either side of two panels here. You wanna make sure your hearts are all going the same direction. And then we're about ready to add our borders to our wall hanging mini quilt. To make the borders for the table topper version of this pattern, you are first going to start with your applique. You will want to, um, if you're gonna sew around it before um, you assemble your quilt top together, sew around all of your applique letters. You can see I have done that here. And then you are going to trim down your background on this fabric to the size indicated in the pattern. Now, one way that I do that is I measure above and below the letters and trim up those sides. And then in order to make sure that my applique phrase is centered, then I will take and line up, I'm gonna kind of hold this up so you can see that you can tell through the shadow and line up the first letter and the last letter. And then I will um, 
line up my edges and kind of create a finger press in the side so I know where the center is. And then I will divide the measurement in half and measure from that center marking to each side to make sure that my phrase stays centered in um, on my background piece. And then I will line up my rows in pairs. Um, and I don't try to worry too terribly much about things, but I do try to make sure that there's at least um, not directly above each other the exact same print, um, just to be able to um, have things kind of spread out a little bit more. Once you have all your rows assembled and your applique done, then you are going to just sew your patchwork um, rows on the top and the bottom. One thing you're going to want to pay attention to is if you have any, any fabrics, excuse me, that are directional in your patchwork border is to make sure that they are right side up. And in order to facilitate that, two things that I'm going to do. First is I'm going to line up the center of my patchwork block with the center of my um, applique. And this is where that crease that we created in order to help um, trim it evenly comes in handy because now we still have it in the center of our patchwork or our applique block. But then I line them up so that they're facing the right direction. They're both right sides up. And then you just take the top one and flip it over because you want to keep the bottom of your patchwork row, if there is a bottom, lined up with the top of your applique piece. Or for this lower one, it's opposite. You want the top of your applique or the top of your patchworks row to line up with the bottom of your applique piece. So usually it just helps me visually to kind of see those, you know, in the right order and then just flip it on top. That way I make sure that all of my prints and everything are going the right direction. So again, I will line up this center seam with my pressed crease. I will put a pin here, line up the edges, pin along it and sew, making sure that my seam allowances are um, nice and even. And then I am going to press my seam allowance toward the patchwork border here. When we go to assemble our cornerstone blocks with the stars, it's just much easier to press towards the center of that block and that leaves you um, needing your seam allowance pressed towards the patchwork on this applique border. So um, once you have those done, then you will end up with four um, of your applique patchwork border rows. Then we're going to assemble our star blocks so that we can finish putting together our mini quilt. To begin our star blocks, the first thing you're going to do is you need to pull out the blocks that will then become the corners of your star block. So I have a star block here and you can see that there are four blocks in the corner that are just plain squares. Then we're going to make a bunch of half square triangles and use our center block to create our whole star. When I am choosing which 16 squares from our pile of cut squares. I just try to do a variety, especially if you're using a bunch of different prints. That way you can kind of help to change up all of the letters because when you go to sew your star block to your patchwork block, we're continuing the patchwork look and each square is going to have a different color and you want to be able to make sure that you're continuing that distribution of color and prints along the whole row all the way through your star print. So I like to have a variety set aside so that I can kind of arrange them into my star block. I try not to be too finicky about it, but also if I can avoid having two of the exact same print right next to each other, I'm gonna do my best to make sure that happens. So once we've pulled out the blocks we're gonna save for our corners, then we are going to take all of the white squares that we have cut and we are going to mark a diagonal line on all of them. Now again, if you have a, a way to use your machine, if you have a laser or things like that, you can skip the drawing step, but um, I don't do that. So then you're going to take one white square and one colored square from your pile 
and you're just going to line them up right sides together. Make sure they're lined up evenly and sew right along that drawn line. You'll trim a quarter of an inch away from that sewn line and then you will press the seam allowance open. Your half square triangle is going to look like this. And then you are going to arrange your rows to create your star blocks. To create your star blocks, you're going to create three basically rows. You're going to have your four corner blocks. You're going to have two pairs of half square triangles, and then you're going to have your center block. It's helpful when you're arranging these, if you already have the rows of your applique borders together, just pull one over here, that you can um, kind of figure out if you know which side you're building, then you can double check and make sure that you're not creating any duplicates of prints next to each other. And again, I like to distribute color, scale, and um, contrast around the star block as well, just to continue that um, distribution of color and, and everything as well as I possibly can. Once you have your blocks and arranged as you like, then you're going to sew the half square triangles together along one colored edge. And I like to press the seam allowances open just to help this block lay flat. Then once you have all of those pairs together, then you're going to sew the rows across. I press the seam allowances on these seams towards the solid piece of fabric, so not a pieced fabric. So on these top and bottom rows, I'm going to press the seam allowances towards the corners, and on this center row, I'm going to press it towards my center fabric here. And then you will sew the rows together. And again, I find it easier to press towards the center block only because you have these points in here and it's just easier um, to fold this fabric than to fold the point fabric. Once you have your star block sewn together, then you're going to sew them on either side of one applique row. So you'll have two rows and there will be stars on either side of the applique block on each row. Then you're just going to proceed to the assembly pattern, um, the pattern assembly steps in the pattern, just like you do with the wall hanging. And then your mini quilt is finished. The final step in making our Be Merry project, um, whether you're doing the mini quilt wall hanging version or the table topper version is to add the borders. So whether you're doing the patchwork, the two patch border, or you're doing the applique border for the table topper, it's gonna look the same way. You're gonna have two borders that do not have um, the shaped corner stones and then two borders that do. So I have my um, borders with the hearts and then I have my regular borders. So you're going to first put on the borders that don't have the cornerstone shapes. And you're going to do that. Um, the first tip that I have is you have a little bit of play in your applique center here. So if your seam allowance is off enough, just consistently a little bit, um, you may find that your patchwork borders are a little bit bigger than they need to be or a little bit smaller. So first start by measuring the length of those patchwork borders. And then if it's they're pretty consistent, but different than what the measurements call for, go ahead and trim down your applique center to that measurement. Um, otherwise, you can just go ahead and trim off any extra on the other sides. But what you're going to want to do is mark um, the center of your wreath. So in order to kind of square up my wreath, I folded it in half and then I kind of if you lift it up, you can kind of see the shadow of the applique on the other side. And it's not like exactly lined up, but I wanted to make sure that my applique stayed center when I went ahead and trimmed it down. So when they're looking like they're about the half circles, then you just finger press at those um, center markings. And you do that both directions so that you can kind of see on here where I have my little pinch mark there that's indicating the center of that applique. 
Then what you're gonna wanna do when you go ahead and add your two side borders is you have eight blocks up and down on your patchwork border. You want to match up the seam of the middle seam of your border with that middle marking on your applique center. And that way your borders are going to be evenly lined up on both sides. So you'll go ahead and you'll match that up and then you'll pin both sides and then sew them down. And I am pressing my seam allowance away from this center applique block towards the patchwork borders. Once both of those are on, then you are going to go ahead and add your borders with the cornerstones. And again, you have a couple of places to kind of match up your um, seam allowances and seams here. So you'll want to match up the center of your border, the center seam with your center marking here. And then on your two cornerstones, you want to match them up with the seams on either side of your block. And then if there's any extra fabric on one layer or the other, um, use your sewing machine to kind of help ease in some of that give. And that way your um, quilt top hopefully will turn out as square as possible. Once you have both of those borders on, um, the last thing I'm gonna suggest that you do is do what's kind of, some people call it a victory lap. Just sew around your entire piece at a scant quarter of an inch. Um, what that will do is help keep all of these seams. You have a lot of seams around your borders and you want to keep them from stretching um, before it gets quilted. So just take one big loop all the way around your whole project and um, keep those seams all nice and together. And then you can go ahead and um, quilt it and bind it however you like. On my mini quilts, I like to hang them just using clear thumbtacks, but if you like to add a hanging sleeve or whatever, do that before you add the binding, but after you've quilted it, um, or you can add little corners and use a dowel to hang it or however you like to do that. Um, or if you're turning it into a pillow, I'll quilt it first and then I'll make a pillow back and then put the pillow back and the pillow front together using binding. Um, that's just the way that I like to do it. I do have a video tutorial on my YouTube channel that shares how I make a pillow back. Um, it's, well, I actually have two different versions, but the one that I would use for this one is the hidden zipper pillow back. And it has just a nice little hidden zipper on the back so that it doesn't, it's not exposed, doesn't smack anybody, doesn't catch hair, um, but it makes a nice clean look to your pillows. That is our Be Merry table topper mini quilt pattern. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, go ahead and subscribe for more projects like this, and I hope to see you soon. Until then, happy sewing, friends.